That is how I learned it in school. The heroic black man swinging his hammer on the railroad line. But John Henry was actually a real person. That is the conclusion of historian Scott Reynolds Nelson, who wrote a book about him. During the late 19th century, Henry did do dangerous work, blasting tunnels for the new Chesapeake and Ohio Railway. Back then, it was indeed done by hand, using a hand drill and hammer. The part about him battling a machine was also quite real, just not in the way that you think. Reynolds discovered documentation of a 19-year-old Black American man by that name in previously unexplored records of the University, of, I mean, of the Virginia Penitentiary, which helps explain why Henry was forced to do this work in the first place. Railroad work was escalating after the end of the Civil War. The Southern landscape was devastated by the war, and 4 million African Americans were now free. But the South, as well as the entire nation had a big problem, finding a replacement for the huge free labor force called slavery. In short, lots of industries needed cheap labor for the tough jobs, the inhumane, dangerous work of physically building American industry. The 13th Amendment may have freed black people from bondage, but it also provided a loophole. Slavery and involuntary servitude were banished except for those committing, who had been convicted of committing a crime. Enter convict labor, where imprisoned Americans could literally be leased to industries who needed workers. The prison convict leasing system of involuntary servitude filled the labor supply shortage in the southern plantations and in growing businesses like the railroad monopolies who were connecting the nation east to west. It became a huge industry which relied on incarcerating as many black people as possible to essentially re-enslave them. I mean, you could get arrested for anything, vagrancy, speaking too loudly in front of white women, true story, or even for just being unemployed. Among other work, prisoners were tasked with the deadly work of railroad construction. Now, the historian that I mentioned, Scott Reynolds Nelson, says that John Henry was one of those men. The New York Times review of his book details how Henry was from New Jersey, a Union soldier. In 1866, he was arrested for allegedly stealing from a grocery store and sentenced to 10 years in prison. He was sent to the Virginia State Penitentiary, where the warden, desperate to raise revenue, had begun leasing prisoners to the railroad for 25 cents a day. Nelson also says that John Henry did not die of exhaustion, as folklore suggests, more likely, he died of silicosis, a fatal lung disease that took the lives of many of the workers who were forced to inhale crystalline dust from the rocks as they cut tunnels through those mountains. Like many figures in black history, John Henry's story has been transformed over time into feel-good folklore rather than an emblem of black oppression and corporate greed. And the ways in which slavery by another name persisted long after the Civil War. For example, ballads, books, and statues like this one in Talcott, West Virginia, depict John Henry as large and muscular, a Paul Bunyan type. But the real guy was described as a small man, perfectly sized for tunnel work. And the machine that he battled, the steam drill, took his life with chemicals, not by noble exhaustion, and did the same to many of the black laborers who were forced to hand drill holes deep into solid rock in order to set explosives to cut through those mountains. Their inhalation of dust and chemicals, the exposure to disease, that gets left out of the heroic ballads. We don't learn about the Chinese migrants who laid the tracks of the Transcontinental Railroad either. But we do know about the railroad tycoons who emerged in the Gilded Age. Theodore Roosevelt sought to end business monopolies like theirs, going after a railroad holding company that threatened to monopolize rail traffic across the Western United States. But then Ronald Reagan undid much of that, and Donald Trump made it even worse. Fast forward to today, where an environmental disaster is currently unfolding in the town of East Palestine, Ohio. On February 3rd, about 50 train cars, including several carrying hazardous materials, derailed and later burst into flames, forcing almost half the town to evacuate. Now, fortunately, no one was killed, but to prevent an explosion, officials conducted a controlled release of toxic chemicals, sending a massive dark cloud of toxic fumes billowing across 
the small town. The Environmental Protection Agency said the main chemicals included vinyl chloride, a human carcinogen, and phosgene, a highly toxic gas that was used as a weapon in World War I. Nevertheless, just days after this toxic plume engulfed the area, officials told the residents of East Palestine that it was safe to return. But one week later, some are still not convinced. And honestly, why should they be? Residents have told reporters that they are experiencing headaches and nausea, smelling a pungent odor described as a mixture of nail polish remover and burning tires. Some say their eyes are burning. People are finding dead fish in the waterways. And today, a local NBC News affiliate there, WLWT, is reporting low levels of dangerous chemicals detected in the Ohio River downstream from this incident. The NTSB is still investigating the exact reason for the derailment, but they say it was likely caused by mechanical issues on one of the rail car axles. And while that investigation is taking place, there is renewed scrutiny on some of the deregulation that has left the industry vulnerable to these kinds of disasters including the Trump administration's reversal of an Obama-era rule that required braking system upgrades for high-hazard trains hauling flammable liquids, and a rule created in 2020 allowing liquefied national gas to be shipped by rail with no additional safety regulations. Trains can run 100 or more tank cars filled with 30,000 gallons of these substances per the Trump administration. Now, just to put that in perspective, just 22 train tank cars filled with liquid natural gas hold the same amount of energy as the Hiroshima bomb. Some experts are sounding the alarm, urging the Biden administration to undo these policies before it is too late. The secretary for the Railroad Workers United puts it bluntly, telling The Guardian, the Ohio wreck is the tip of the iceberg and a red flag, saying if something is not done, then it's going to get worse and the next derailment could be cataclysmic. Joining me now is Mustafa Santiago Ali, executive vice president of the National Wildlife Federation and a former senior advisor at the, Nash, at the Environmental Protection Agency. And NBC News correspondent, Ron Allen, who's been covering this major story unfolding in Ohio. Ron, my friend, I wanna to go to you first, and it's good to see you uh, even under these circumstances, but please describe for me what folks in Palestine, Ohio, are telling you they are experiencing, feeling, seeing uh, in their town after this explosion? I think there's a significant amount of fear and uncertainty, Joy, and that's fueling some of these reports that uh, of people feeling ill effects because of smoke and, and the water, what they're, they're tasting, what they're feeling. Not to say that they're hallucinating, but, but I think that there's a lot of concern about the long-term impacts of this massive fire and, and plume of smoke. I mean, to see this, it was extraordinarily dramatic. It was a, just a huge thing to happen in a small little town of some 5,000 people. Um, they opened schools today, so that happened. We just spoke to the EPA in Ohio about all this. They continue to say that uh, they believe that the water, the groundwater, the drinking water in that community is safe, and the federal EPA is monitoring the air throughout the past week. Every environmental briefing has said that they are not finding levels of anything dangerous. That's, that's a concern. Um, of course, the residents are not sure. They want to see this situation play out for some time. Uh, because, again, if you look at the wreckage, it's just a, such a stunning thing. Remember, this happened at 9 o'clock on a Friday night. People were just rousted from their homes. There was this huge, loud explosion. And now, a week later, they're back in their homes. The evacuation order was lifted. The governors of Pennsylvania and Ohio, it's in the corner there in that border area, said things were safe. But a lot of residents just are not so yeah. sure. Yeah. It sounds like what was said about Flint <laughs> when they said, oh, no, you can drink the water again in Flint. And then it turned out, nope. Uh, real quick, before I, I go to bring Mustafa in, Ron, you, you rode around that town. You talked to people. Did this strike you as an affluent, a wealthy town? No, it was a very rural town, I thought. Um, very few, uh, very, very rural town. And uh, again, about 5,000 people. Um, yeah. a, a lot of farmland, too, which is another big concern. Um, a lot of um, waterways and so forth. This is not urban in any, by any stretch of the imagination. Very small downtown. Very small fire department, which um, uh, apparently used all the, everything they had to try and fight this fire. And a lot of their equipment now is not in use anymore. So they're looking for more yeah. firefighting equipment. And, in the meantime. So it's taken a big toll. And there are now, of course, uh, many uh, class action lawsuits being filed by residents mm. who, among other things, want medical monitoring and screening to happen.
And, and they should get it. You know, uh, Mustafa, it doesn't surprise me that this is not an affluent town, that it's a rural town, because, you know, that is where um, the biggest risk lies. And this controlled, you know, explosion to try to prevent an even worse, I guess, catastrophe. I mean, these are some of the chemicals that were released into the air between the actual derailment and what was done after. Vinyl chloride, butyl acrylate, ethylene glycol monobutyl ether, uh, ethyl NX, ethyl exyl acrylate, and isobutylene. I don't know what any of that is, but it doesn't sound like anything that I would want to breathe or that I would want my kids to breathe. How do we end up in a situation like this where a, in, in 20, in the year of our Lord 2023, we have a train derailment, a train filled with chemicals going through rural America, and it leaves this kind of devastation. Well, you know, Joy, we continue to, to create these sacrifice zones across our country. Some folks don't actually realize that we've got 160,000 miles of track that's out there. We had 1,700 derailments uh, in the last five years. And if you look at where many of those train tracks run, they run in lower wealth white communities. They run through farmland. They run through black and brown communities. So we have to pay particular attention to the sets of needs that exist there. We've got to make sure that we're also taking care of the infrastructure that has to be in place because these trains, in many instances, are carrying these uh, toxic chemical bombs, if you will, when you have these types of derailments and then if there are the explosions that are in place. And most folks need to also understand that those chemicals that you uh, laid out for everyone, a number of those are cancer-causing chemicals. So if you breathe, the average person breathes 20,000 times a day and you happen to breathe in some of these chemicals, uh, then you are, you know, exposing yourself to the possibility and the risk of having cancer or liver or kidney disease or a number of other diseases that are a part of this. But it all goes back to us making sure that we are protecting our most vulnerable communities and the waterways where some of those chemicals are going to go also actually lead to places like the Ohio River, which is one of the dirtiest yeah. rivers that we already have. So we are in the middle of Black History Month, and starting tonight and going forward on this show, we want to introduce you to some of the states of our disunion, states where Americans are struggling to exercise their right to vote, to make their way out of poverty, and to live free of government control of their wombs. We will cover the states facing the hardest struggles for democracy, the ones banning books and curtailing the right to choose and passing draconian anti-trans laws. But we'll also show you some of the states that are winning, where our democracy is working, but tonight, we want to start with a state that unfortunately is still stuck in its white supremacist past, Mississippi, where a white supermajority in the heavily gerrymandered state house voted to create an entirely separate court system and expanded police force within the city of Jackson, the blackest city in America, that would be appointed completely by white state officials. That means that the voters of Jackson, which is 80 percent black, do not get to elect the judges or prosecutors in this separate district, unlike what happens in every other part of the state. White officials currently hold all the statewide positions that would do the appointing, and no black official has ever held any of these positions. In fact, the last time a black Mississippian held statewide office was during Reconstruction. And the state, despite being one-third African American, is gerrymandered to have exactly one black congressman, Representative and January 6th Committee Chairman Benny Thompson. Meanwhile, the Republican who introduced this draconian bill says it's because of the high crime rates and backlog of court cases in the county that contains Jackson, which did I mention is the state capital? Jackson's mayor has called the plan colonialist and racist and said it reminds him of apartheid. And joining me now is the mayor of Jackson, Chokwe Antar Lumumba. Um, and Mayor Lumumba, please explain how it can be possible that the capital um, of Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, is, I think, to your point, going to be governed under apartheid style? Well, I think that uh, to speak to it honestly, uh, I'm, I'm reflecting on the words of Coach Dennis Green, who once said that they are who we thought they were. Uh, you know, as we've been calling out these clearly racist policies, uh, that has been done uh, much to the chagrin of state leadership, uh, saying that we're giving Mississippi a black eye. And to be clear, uh, it is not our words that give Mississippi a black eye. It is the actions that they're taking, uh, actions that will not allow or disenfranchise uh, voters in Jackson, in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, this this particular uh, law is fraught with constitutional violations, uh, equal protection. Uh, it is seeking to create a district which is the most densely white population populated area in the city of Jackson. Uh, in addition to uh, a police force or, or a militarized force uh, that does not have uh, direct 
uh, accountability to the residents. Uh, within the district that already exists, there have been numerous claims of, of uh, issues of, of police misconduct that are not being challenged, that are not being followed up on. Uh, and so there's a multitude of concerns here. It sounds like 1980-era Pretoria. I mean, in, in 1890, Mississippi enacted a racist constitution that to strip uh, African Americans of any rights and the right to vote because of the really, you know, historic and heavy voting by former enslaved people to elect statewide officials and the lieutenant governor to really, you know, make an incredible strides. How could it be that more than 100 years after the Civil War, Mississippi still is governed this way when it has the highest black population in the entire country, percentage wise. Well, I, I thank you for recounting that history, Joy, because uh, along with that history was a narrative that said that uh, it was in the slave or it was in black people's interest not to be burdened uh, with that heavy weight of having to select electoral leadership, uh, much in the same way as they have created this district that they set to a point the representative who created this legislation or introduced this legislation suggested that the reason that he thought that these judges should be appointed rather than elected is because we wanted, quote, uh, the best of the best, uh, which is to suggest that Jackson residents are not intelligent enough or, or aware of their, their needs enough in order to elect those, uh, those individuals for themselves. Uh, and, and so this has been a battle that we've been in uh, for, for some time. Uh, it is because they are allowed to bring Trojan horses, such as the Capitol Complex uh, District, which was initially introduced in 2017 as a suggested aid to infrastructure. Uh, at that time, myself, along with a coalition of people that called ourselves the Coalition of Economic Justice, opposed it because we saw what it was. Uh, but you did have some legislators uh, that looked like us who were in support. Uh, but I do want to be clear that what they were presented with uh, was not what we see today. They were presented with an opportunity to assist a, a community that is in much need of infrastructure support. And so we were, well, we're forced to compete against our interests. Uh, you, 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 there's still a water crisis in Jackson. Federal funds have been pledged. It, it appears now that the, the Mississippi white legislators are trying to take over those funds and take them out of your hands and other elected uh, local Jackson officials' hands. This, as Brett Favre, is threatening to sue the people who pointed out that he was in possession of funds to build his daughter a, a volleyball complex that belonged to the impoverished people in the state of Mississippi. He was essentially in, 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 in a mode of taking from the poor, and now he's suing for his reputation back. It, it feels like everything is upside down in Jackson and in Mississippi. It, it feels that way because that's the truth. Um, and, and at a time where uh, the state is littered with... Um, questions of integrity, uh, where there's incompetence there. They charge communities like Jackson, who have been devoid of resources of, of being uh, the ones that are incompetent. Uh, there has been a willful indifference uh, or a, a uh, intentional neglect around the issues that, that Jackson needs. Yeah. Uh, and this is part and parcel of a larger effort. And, and my guess is, I'll bet you Tate Reeves and them are busy trying to pass laws, trying to outlaw history, because you wouldn't want people to learn how we got here. Jackson, Mississippi Mayor Chokwe Antar Lumumba, thank you very much.